Um, I am Audrey Russick, the food and wine archivist at the UC Davis Library. And it is a real pleasure to welcome all of you here to our event tonight. It promises to be an illuminating conversation about the art of wine writing and the challenges facing wine writers today. So it is now my privilege to introduce our university librarian and vice provost of digital scholarship, Mackenzie Smith, who will provide some context for this evening's program. So thank you, Mackenzie. Thank you, Audrey, and welcome everybody. We're delighted to have such a robust audience, both in person and virtually on Zoom. Uh, thank you very much for joining us to hear from three women whose voices have helped shape our understanding of California wine. Tonight, we're celebrating the impact and future of wine writing as showcased in the book On California, From Napa to Nebbiolo, Wine Tales from the Golden State, published by the Academy du Vin Library. On California offers a glimpse into the unique story of California wine, and its authors exemplify the crucial role of wine writing in connecting readers, wine, and history in the making. But the book has special meaning to the UC Davis Library. One of its contributing authors is renowned Napa Valley vintner and philanthropist Warren Winiarski, who won the wine, who's, who's wine won the famous 1976 Judgment of Paris and went on to become a landmark wine for California. Warren has long shared the UC Davis Library's appreciation for the importance of wine writing to tell the story of California wine and how our state was able to achieve such extraordinary success in such a short period of time. It's largely thanks to Warren's generous gift to build the library's wine writer collection that UC Davis now has the greatest collection on wine writing in the world. Stephen Spurrier, who co-organized the 1976 Judgment of Paris, also created the Academy de Vin Library in 2019 to, share, to show his appreciation for good wine writing and the pleasure of learning about wine through words as well as taste. One of the Academy of Vin Library's most prolific authors and who also contributed to On California is Hugh Johnson, the best-selling wine writer in the world. The UC Davis Library is the very proud home of Hugh Johnson's papers, and his manuscripts, photographs, and notes reveal to us how the story of California wine unfolded over the last 60 years. While Hugh was unable to join us in person tonight, hopefully you had an opportunity to watch his recorded message for us in the lobby on your way in, and if you didn't, you'll have a chance to see it later at the reception. And I would also like to take this opportunity to wish you a happy birthday, which we had very much hoped to do in person, but maybe next year. Now we turn to tonight's program, a panel discussion on the past, present, and future of wine writing and On California Wine. All three of tonight's panelists contributed to On California and are very well known for their insights into wine, winemaking, and the wine industry. To begin, I'm pleased to introduce Kelly White who will moderate tonight's panel discussion. Kelly is the author of Napa Valley Then and Now. She's also a two-time recipient of the distinguished Louis Roederer International Wine Writer Award. And in addition to her writing, she was named one of the top 10 sommeliers in the US by Food and Wine Magazine. Next, Elaine Chacon Brown is a James Beard Foundation Award nominee and was named Wine Communicator of the Year by the International Wine and Spirit Competition. Elaine has served as the US executive editor for JancisRobinson.com and as co-producer and host for Psalm TV. Their writing has been featured in numerous publications, including Decanter and Wine and Spirits magazine. Finally, Claire Tooley is a master of wine and has led seminars at the Napa Valley Wine Academy and the World of Pinot Noir. She also serves as vice president of guest experience with the Boisset Collection. Very exciting role. In 2014, she moved to California and is the California correspondent for Decanter Magazine and writes for the website of Tim Atkin, another well-known master of wine. Kelly, Claire, and Elaine, thank you so much for coming to UC Davis tonight to join us. And now I'm gonna hand the mic over to you. Wonderful, thank you so much uh, for having us. Thank you to everyone in the room uh, and thank you to everyone watching at home. Uh, we, the three of us are very excited to be here and to be talking about the past and future of wine writing. Um, so 
we don't have a lot of time, so we want to be very strategic in the material that we do cover. Um, we've made the decision not to specifically address um, necessarily the content in On California, which is a book we're all extremely proud of, and we highly recommend that you all um, read a copy. Um, it, we all put a lot of work into it, and I think, I think we nailed it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> Nor, actually, for those of you that submitted questions ahead of time, uh, and please accept our apologies, are we going to answer some of the more broad questions about the wine industry at large? We really want to take this opportunity, uh, in, really in honor of Hugh Johnson, who couldn't be here today, to talk, about, uh, to talk about wine writing, to talk about where it's going, where it's been, our roles in it, how it's changing, and, and, and things of that nature. So, very specifically, um, the description of this event address, um, highlighted three key questions, which was the past and future of wine writing, the key issues facing wine writers today, and the roles of storytelling, tradition, and innovation within wine writing. So I think let's get the negative stuff over with um, and talk <laughs> first about the key issues facing wine writers today. What are some of the major challenges that you two see? Pay is the, is the biggest thing. It's like very simple. Uh, publications worldwide have decreased. Um, multiple countries in the world actually have lost their wine publications entirely. Or um, in a country I was in recently, unfortunately, their major, major wine magazine is several million dollars in debt. And so writers are not being paid for work they've already done. Um, just the change in how publications are produced and, and where they're published has radically changed how we write, what is deemed as publishable, um, what people assume others want to read, and then that all percolates into how on earth do we make a living doing this. Now, Claire, you can speak to this specifically because you've always balanced wine writing with a life in the trade. Yes, I, I would say that um, one of the challenges, uh, I'm with Elaine on this one, I think that um, writers are poorly paid, perhaps they always have been, but, um, and maybe wine is no exception. But I do think that there is uh, also, um, on one hand, you know, the wine world has never been so accessible uh, through a, a number of media, and, and, uh, and the written word, if you like, has almost been trounced by imagery or... Um, uh, visualization and and so so a concept of of bringing the word and the written word to express wine is has maybe been um, undermined bit by bit by this this instant accessibility to um, sound bites or to um, scores or to one liners or you know in a way that that that, that is the way we should promote and and talk about wine, and we're about selling wine. I mean, I'm, I'm in the business of buying and selling wine. So where does where does writing fit into that? And 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 is it is it an intrinsic part, which it should be, in my opinion, um, or is it cut away as being something that is more elitist and more, and therefore um, uh, not uh, not something that is championed by by more publications or, um, or areas. So I think that, I think there are a lot of challenges. Um, I, think, uh, I think more specifically though, there is a challenge of finding, for, for writers anyway, is for forging their own path through all of that, finding their voice, and then finding a way to have that voice heard. We, we, in, in our pre-discussion, you had mentioned the challenge of first understanding who your audience is and how do you find that? Yes, the reader, the reader. Any, anyone who writes um, should be considering the reader. And so who is that? Where are they? Um, are they interested? What are they interested in? Um, uh, and, and how to communicate in a way that both expresses the individual writer's um, passion for the written word and for the for the for the for the style for the voice and so forth, but also recognizing who that reader is and 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 how to how to connect with them through the written word. I think wine is an interesting case in that regard because mm. we're uh, hopefully as 
writers reaching an audience that's from outside wine, but curious at least in wine, or maybe even in love with it. But interestingly, one of the things that I really appreciate about the commitments that Warren has made uh, in the last several years is he really has spoken passionately about how wine writing has really shaped the wine industry and really helped, in California's case at least, really helped grow the success of California wine, and that was part of why he committed to supporting the, ar the archival work here at UC Davis. And, um, and was passionate about this book as well. And yes. so I think it's, wine is an interesting case because our, a significant part of our audience is the industry itself, and, but at the same time, it, it must also be more than that. I think that's a, California wine is a perfect way to talk about this too because you know, to bring back <clears throat> Stephen Spurrier who had the Judgment of Paris in 1976, we often talk about that event as a turning point in the popularization of California wine. But what we forget to sort of connect to is that American wine media was born two and three years later with the establishment of the Wine Spectator and Robert Parker's, Parker's Wine Advocate, which were founded in 1978 and 1979. So it's not to take anything away from the success of the Judgment of Paris, but I think you can't divorce the birth of American wine media and then the attention that, that necessarily focused on California wine from fast forwarding to where we are today. Well, and Spurrier himself said that the, the amplification of the results of the 1976 event depended on George Tabor doing his work Absolutely. in writing, right. and that the, the tasting itself wouldn't have had very limited relevance, except it got written about so much, and then again, and then again. And so now we see it as this pivotal event, but at Correct. the time, it actually took quite a long while for it to become important. Right. And so if any editors are out there watching, our rates just doubled, I would say. We've <laughs> proven, the, proven the value. The conversation is over. Um, but no, I think I'd like to go back to this idea of voice, because I think it's really important. Um, El Elaine and I just had the privilege of um, being involved in the Wine Writers Symposium. And one of the biggest concerns of writers that were more fledgling in their career was that they didn't feel like wine experts yet, and so they didn't feel like they mm. had a right to communicate about wine until they achieved that expertise. How does that sit with you? What do you think about that mentality? Claire? I, I think that's fascinating, and I think it's a real, it's a real shame to start from the, from, from the perspective of I have to know everything about something in order to then start writing. However, the, the best writing, certainly the best wine writing, cle clearly is based on when you're reading it, uh, you are so reassured that the content is beautifully researched. Um, whether that's a personal evocation of a wine or a, or a memory or, a, or, a, or, a, or a, a, an opinion, um, but, but um, I think that uh, one thing that Hugh Johnson told me years and years and years ago, I've been very privileged to know him for, um, for many years, and he said, Claire, you, you have to just keep writing. Because as you keep writing and as you keep growing and as you keep learning and researching through um, either for specific topics or indeed just in, just in, 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 in the course of your prof professional life, so, so you will... So, so your voice will become more in tune with not just the topic, but yourself. And, and we've been talking about this, that, that it's um, finding your voice is something which is a, is, is a, is a long-term process, but you have to start somewhere and you have to keep going. And, and what, what is so extraordinary about Hugh Johnson's writing, I think, is that it is, it, it, it's his voice that comes across. It's a very specific, very personal, um, and and it's uh, uh, and it's 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 an extra. We all agree it's it's extraordinary writing, um, but we have talked about this quite a lot, haven't we? Yeah. So one of the, I actually mentor a lot of um, newer writers, and and as Kelly said, we just spent several days with uh, quite a few of them, and um, I think there's this ex expectation, as you were describing, Kelly, that for a newer writer, they have to hurry up and know everything to have the authority to write it. But actually, one of the great pieces of advice that Karen McNeil, who wrote the foreword for this book, gave me was um, that I should 
go in assuming my job is to write about what I don't know and to use the writing as a process of getting to know it. And I, I think that the most compelling wine writing for me, if we think all the way back to Gerald Asher and his writing, it was about discovering the topic as you read. And so it became a relationship with his ability to deliver that information and, and draw you in and make you feel as if you were welcome. And um, I really like thinking of like shifting that. We're not here to be experts, we're here to share in our discovery process with our readers. And yes. I think that is really so fundamental to growing an appreciation of wine because as somebody who has a, peop, a lot of people in my life that, that aren't into wine, right? part of the reason why they're not into it is because there feels like this huge barrier of entry. Right? You ha it's a different language. It's a different, you know, it's a different maybe, it feels like it's, it belongs to a different class. Um, that if we l linger longer in those sort of first moments of falling in love with something and communicate that in a way that is attractive, that's going to bring people in uh, to an industry that's very famous for shutting people out, mm. I think. Yes. So the style and the flow, um, the words chosen. Now, there's a lot of debate, I think, in the wine industry. And, and to your point, we, we, we write about wine and, and, and many of the readers are those who already, who already know a lot about about the, the topic or, or um, but, but, the, but, but how um, the, the, the flow of, of any script um, is ultimately what takes the reader and, 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 and goes with them. And, and so, so it doesn't, it's almost, it doesn't matter what you're writing about. If it's really good writing, um, it, it, it will, it'll be compelling. But the beauty of wine at least as a topic and as a subject, is that it, um, by its very nature, it has this multiple kaleidoscope aspect um, of, uh, from, and, and that you can come at it from so many different directions, which I think is why there are so many people who want to write about it. Growing our audience of who wants to read about it is our job. Yeah, so one of the things we talked about quite a bit in the symposium was, again, this point about voice and that everything is online today, right? So you can Google anything you need to know. So if you're new to wine, well, you can just look it up. So then the writer becomes the person who's able to take some of that information and make it compelling or tell it in a way that hadn't occurred to the reader before, and that becomes the way to connect. So it's not enough to just deliver information, but how do you shape that information into this message that's in a way opening us up to a whole new way of thinking or a whole new world even? Yeah, I think when I think of the most successful wine writers, and I don't mean successful in terms of book sales, I mean the most, the, the ones that transport me, the ones I go back to, it's not always necessarily the most knowledgeable. I, I know people, master sommeliers, that know more about wine than I ever will, but they couldn't explain carrots to a rabbit. You know, I think it's, it's the, <clears throat> you have to be able to let, somebody needs to trust you, yes. and they need to like you, yes. uh, in order to want to hear what you have to say. And that's, I think, really hard, um, but if you're a genuine person and you're in touch with yourself and you're honest, it's maybe less hard than yes. learning about German wine law, for example, right? Um, yes. If you sort of relax into that. Yes. Um, what about, um, let's talk a little bit about the, the changing media landscape um, because it's different now than it was when perhaps um, Hugh Johnson was getting started. How do you address, how do you find purchase in this sort of fragmented media landscape? So I, Ke Kelly and I became friends pretty quickly after the two of us started, and I think partly because we started in this strange transition of communication where um, print was still far more relevant than it is now, and people were assuming traditional print media was really the driver of good writing, but this other thing was emerging, and people were struggling to understand what it was and how to do it. And so it's an interesting moment of, I feel like my experience is connected to both. Um, 
whatever this new thing is and traditional print media. And so for me to make that transition, I had to be willing to be curious and creative and take risks and experiment. And at the same time, figure out how to stay absolutely true to what I care about while doing all of that experimentation. So that again, my own curiosity and interest stayed the center point of trying out new genres of writing or new, or new platforms of communication. And I think that is, for me, I think that whether it's made me successful or not, I don't think I am the person to answer, but I, what I can say is it's kept me going, at least. I, for, just in case anyone watching isn't aware of your early work, can you talk about how you got started and the different things you tried, specifically because it's some of the most creative um, approaches to wine communication that I've witnessed? Um, <laughs> I'm going to ignore the last half of that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I actually got started in wine by drawing my tasty notes at a time when the visual landscape that you were describing wasn't so dominant. Instagram wasn't really a thing for those of you that are in, on Instagram. Um, and so I created this idea of visual tasty notes, um, so literally hand drawing what the experience of the wine was like to me, but in a way that I thought was transparent to the viewer. And a uh, historian of taste ended up contacting me because this, had, it turned out, had never been done before, which seems crazy to me. But, uh, but there's like so much visual communication now that I think the idea that this was a new form of communication, for beverages at least, is, it's surprising to think about. But that's literally how I got started in wine. Because this thing hadn't been done before, it suddenly, who is this person doing it? But as soon as I got any attention, from illustrated tasty notes, I became very resistant <laughs> to continuing to do it because the attention made me uncomfortable. So I swung very hard into my other background, which is academia, and I started writing very, very academic writing. But it turned out that was also writing very academically about wine in a mainstream context was also unusual. So then I started getting attention doing that, and I was like, no, no, no. And so I started, <laughs> so I swung over into philosophy. and started writing uh, kind of like philosophical explorations of what wine means and things like that. Um, and then, um, I'm, I'm not sure if there's other things that you were thinking of, but that, that's sort of how, like the, the early landscape of how I got started. And I started then, um, I had a column for a while online where I was combining the illustration work with, the, with text and trying to think through how do I integrate them as a single way of communicating. Um, and then, you know, during the pandemic, I ended up being lucky enough to be one of the first in the world to start doing Zoom webinars in wine, which, again, everyone takes for granted now, but um, 67 Pall Mall and a series I started were the first two in the world at the start of the pandemic. And so I quickly gained a lot of experience doing Zoom-based interviews and communication about wine and seminars and thinking through what works in that context. And that's more recently developed into one of the things mentioned in my bio. So I've done a lot of um, video work in wine now, ranging from 45 second, this is something to know, to hour long um, segments on wine. Um, and have also created podcasts and um, done a lot of podcast interviews. So whole- And, and a lot of public speaking, which lots I know. Of, lots of public yeah. speaking um, all over the world. I have not been able to do a wine seminar in Antarctica yet, but I am, working on it. <laughs> that is the only life goal I have left is Antarctica. That's so, it. That's it. And then, that's it. And then bye. No, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> saying I'd be done. I'm just saying like I, things are fine. Like I'll keep doing stuff, but Antarctica is like the only bucket list item I have. So, yeah. Good. And what about, what about you, Claire? How do you balance um, being in the trade uh, and, and actually working 40 hours a week raising a family, and then tapping into that creative side. Just from a logistics point of view, how do you manage both sides of your brain in that way? Mm. Um, I'm, yet to, I'm yet to work out whether, whether I'm managing it or not. But um, I, do, I have always found writing to be a very personal uh, escape. Mm -hmm. and, and I've used it as such for years, um, never with the intent to publish as such, but, um, but very much to uh, crystallize, maybe in my own way, how something so 
an experience that can be so vast, um, such as wine appreciation or living within a very vibrant profession, um, the, the, the people I meet, the experiences I have, the places I go to, the visualization, the, the, the extraordinary beauty that there is within the wine world, how, how I am able to pay homage to that, I suppose, in a way that, that, is, that is entirely personal. Um, so it is my escape. Um, and, uh, and I love great writing. The, the, the book is full of extraordinarily good writing that hap happens to be about wine. Um, but I think also that um, the, the, the written word is, is as powerful as the spoken word. And I think that if you are able to, I, I've always found with wine that you engage um, with people when you talk about wine, it's actually harder to engage through the written word. So there has to be a bit of both, I think, which you do, which you both do so brilliantly. Um, and then, um, as I say, that sort of crystallization process for me has always been a way of, um, uh, of ordering my thoughts and ordering my busy <laughs> schedule. Um, uh, and it, and it allow, as I said, allows me to sit back a little. The, the one thing I would say, though, is that I spent years studying for, for the Master of Wine and um, thousands of tasting notes and hundreds of essays. And it's a very, it's a, as, you, as you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an academic um, pursuit, uh, which is based entirely, almost entirely, on writing. And, and then, obviously, with this... Um, blind tasting piece, uh, multiple exams, but again, all written. And so I actually had to, and I failed that exam on multiple, multiple attempts and finally passed it. But one of the problems I had at the beginning was that I was allowing myself to be a little bit too free and a little bit too personal when it came to writing my answers. And that was not at all what the examiner was looking for. So over the years, I had to I had to really um, con confine and be much more concise and, and much more practical about how I was writing about wine in that context, in the context of an academic Master of Wine um, exam. And, and, and it, the same went for, my, for the thesis that is the third and final piece of the, um, of the, of the process to, to become an MW. But, um, and so when I finally passed, and that day, that beautiful day, um, <laughs> dawned, um, uh, I, I can't tell you how exciting it was to go, oh, I, maybe now I can go back to what I love doing in, in writing, which is, which is, I admit, um, a, a, a much more personal expression. Um, and I, and I, I, we're not talking about the book, but the, but, the, but the two pieces in there that I did contribute, one is very personal, and one is actually the, uh, the result of the paper that I, um, uh, that I did contribute to the MW for, for the, to pass, which is related to cannabis, actually, to the cannabis industry and, and, its, and its impact on wine. So that's a long answer, but I think um, uh, how I manage is it, it helps me. It, it helps me pay tribute to, um, to an industry that has given me not just a profession, but a, but a lifetime. Well, I think what you're saying really comes circles right back to what we first started talking about, which is knowing your audience, right? And in this case, it's not a public audience, it's an examiner, but you need to tailor the writing yes. style in order to get the best results from that experience. Um, but it's fascinating that this book, arguably, both of your essays in that book have the same audience, but they have different voices. Or not, maybe not different voices. The voice is yours, but they have different tones. Yes. They have different intentions. Yes. Um, and that takes a lot of skill, I think, to be able to kind of shift gears like that, right? Probably uh, when you're starting as a writer and you have some talent, you can maybe do one of those things well. Um, but the ability to challenge yourself, to stretch, to try different genres, to try, you know, to take risks, um, which can be really scary, um, I think is one of the best ways to grow and develop. 
And then what's really interesting, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I would imagine that if you are able to successfully write in different styles, that there will be a connecting thread that will help you find your voice even better. Yes. Yes, I think so. And I think any advice, I mean, if, if we were to, I don't know, if I was to give advice to my younger self or if we were to give ourselves advice, you know, what is it? Well, it's just, it's, it's to, it's to keep going with it and to keep making them, to keep failing, you know, to keep crossing those words out and saying, no, that's not, that's not the word. That's not, that's not the way. Or keep editing, keep self-editing. Um, always, you know, because, um, I mean, at some point you have to let it go. Mm -hmm. um, but I, um, but I think going back to the challenges, challenges facing any writer is self-doubt. I think self-doubt's really important. Yeah. I think there's a mistake culturally that we tend to talk about difficult feelings as if we're supposed to get rid of them. Yes. But I actually um, learned at some point that there are guides and signposts that help me. So self, if my goal is to constantly be growing and trying new things and moving into territory I haven't explored before, self-doubt is the best sign that I'm on the right track to something new. So every time I experience self-doubt, I'm like, oh, thank God, I'm, I'm heading in the right direction. And I have to, had to learn to practice affirming that for myself, but I think it's really important. I mean, can you even imagine proceeding through your career being like, yes, this is comfortable. I, am, I have I am met prepared. some people that <laughs> seem to move that way, and I'm surprised that it's possible, but for some people it might be. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, take a, let's shift gears and talk, um, focus on storytelling for a minute, which is very tied to voice, but is fundamentally different. And um, Elaine, I think your chapter, one of your chapters in this book, specifically on the gallows, is a really good example of using storytelling to challenge people's preconceived ideas about a notion. Can you talk a little bit about your approach to storytelling in general and specifically in regards to that chapter? Well, so I chose Susan Keeble, the brilliant editor of this book, um, kind of contacted me relatively early and there were chapters that she knew she wanted but she wasn't sure who to get to write them and I picked all the chapters I thought everyone else would avoid um, and one of those was ga on ga the gallows. And I actually also specifically selected that topic because I didn't want to read what I thought a lot of people assumed to be true about them. I wanted to actually understand how did they actually become who they are. And I knew that it would take a lot of work to figure that out. So, and so I wanted to find someone who would be willing to do the work. And I realized, oh, well, it has to be me. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> So I thought through what's the best way to do this, and I took a risk and decided I wouldn't talk to anyone at Gallo to do it, because the point was to find out from the outside how did this develop over time. So I went and I found as much old kind of newspaper archive material that I could on the gallows, and as old as I could find. And um, I actually, so I tried to avoid opinion pieces and, just, and find news pieces instead, and I, I spent, my, like weeks and weeks just looking for these things and reading these kinds of things. And then, um, and was like noting a timeline, like mapping a timeline of growth um, as I went. And then once I sort of had that basic timeline, I went, I made sure to fact check myself and then kind of left it and walked around a lot with all this in my head and sort of started mapping, you know, how, what must it have been for them? What commitments did they make based on what I just learned? What values were they chasing? And, and what values did they fulfill? And, and then the, the, the big insight for me was just how completely shaped by the history of Gallo, the California wine industry is. And so many things that in American wine, just how the industry works, how the trade works, how wine is sold, that we take for granted as if it's always been as such actually Gallo created and because it didn't exist before that. And so that's the story I try to tell, as if it's this story of the Gallo's discovering what's possible by creating it as they went. Hmm. And, um, but so that's a little bit of like that kind of process. That's the sort of process I take in writing in general. I try to find a topic that I want to know more about that I, and, and to make sure I'm the right person to do it. And if not, then I'll call someone else <laughs> like, and say, if, you know, I think you'd be great at this. Um, and then I research a lot and then map it in my head and then walk away from it until it comes back to me. But I think that, that, that it's really worth kind of belaboring 
the interesting angle you took because I, I feel like oftentimes when in wine storytelling, we think I'm gonna tell someone's story and then it just becomes an interview, yes. right? Where you're sort of reporting yes. and that's it, that's the work. Maybe you do a little more background research, but really you're letting somebody else tell their story and that's really interesting and that can be really well done, but that's also limiting and sometimes dangerous, right? If somebody has a lot of media training, they might. You know, it might not be as interesting, but overly polished, overly positive. Because the gallows couldn't control what new, not, not that I'm implying they wanted to control. I'm just saying a person can't control what news stories come out about them. Right. right. And a company can't either. And, but especially previously, news stories were based in things that really actually happened. And so, uh, <laughs> and so it's a great way to find out what those things were, you know. Right. I also think it's worth, um, as you mentioned, giving um, Susan Keeble a lot of credit for coming up with a lot of the ideas in this book. And I remember when she reached out to me and she said, you know, we've never met, but I would really love for you to write a chapter in the book on the boffins of California. And I was like, oh my God, absolutely, thank you. I'm so honored. What's a boffin? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a common British term. I have no idea. Uh, it's Language, you it, see, the it, same language, yeah. but, but, but exactly. exactly. <laughs> Two languages very far apart. Yeah. Um, we have 14 more minutes, and um, so I want to end on time. I know everybody's very busy. Um, we have two questions submitted by the audience uh, ahead of time that I think really speak to these topics, um, and I want to give each of us a chance to address it. Um, the first one is, I would say, uh, something we've already touched upon, but specifically it is how does someone build a voice in the wine industry? So again, we've talked about it, we've talked around it, but if you're sitting down with a fledgling writer who's trying to find, your vo find their voice, what is the specific advice? I think you would be an interesting person to answer this actually, <laughs> because... Yes. No, you. Oh. <laughs> no, no, I actually think I'm you're... Passing the baton, I actually okay. Think, no, I mean, I'll, I'll do it if I must. I, right. It's fine, but right. it, the, I'm not being avoided. I actually think to bring it to you... Okay. Because it's not an expected answer. Like, there... Because I, one of the things I find fascinating about you is, you, you know, you talked about writing as your release in a way. You know, you know, sure. Like, like the warm bath at yes, the end of absolutely. the day, right? Yes, But actually... When I think about you and your work and your presence in the wine industry, you absolutely have a perspective, a presence, and a voice. And, and maybe the jobs have come and gone, but in my mind, it's, there's a way in which I can feel from you what you care about. That's mm -hmm. part of your voice. Yes. So I'm actually really curious to hear your answer. If it's a person coming into the wine industry, how do they develop that sense of commitment to what they care about, follow that path while discovering what they even can do? Like, how do they yes. do that? Yes. I, I, well, I'm not, sure there's a, I'm not sure there's a good answer to this other than to have been fortunate enough to recognize what it, what it is that drives you and that drives you to want in a way that is not just a selfish, driven, I'm going to do this, but drives you in a way that you want to share it so much, you, you're so excited by it that you want to share it in some way with as many people as possible so that they come with you, they come with you on this extraordinary journey. And I know how, I know how fluffy that sounds, I know how romantic that sounds and um, uh, I, I, I appreciate that it's um, saying that to someone who is saying, but how do I get my first job in writing? How do I, how do I get published? And I, um, uh, I, I, still, I still maintain that you have to convince not just yourself, but whoever it is that you're in front of, that, that you have something to say that is not, it's not about you, it's about, it's about this, this topic, this this particular subject, this particular moment that is so important to share that you want to find the right words to do that, um, not just for yourself, but for, for, for those listening. And then, and then checking in on that, you know? And are, it, are they listening? Are, being, being, being very 
humble enough to realize that what you've written actually sucks, you know, or it, or it really isn't good enough, or it wasn't researched properly, or it, or it, or it, it was lacking, lacking in substance, you know, and then going, all right, so what does that mean? Let's take a step back, let, let's, let's do it again, let's go back to the drawing board and, and, and so forth. But um, does that answer? Yeah, so I, I think the thing I would add to that, that maybe gives tactics. Yes. Right, because I think as writers it's easy to get into the ideas and the feeling of how we'll do a thing. So, okay, good, now what's the tactic? tactic. Yeah, so the discipline. I think that um, it's okay to do free work as long as it's exactly the kind of work you want to be doing. Otherwise, don't do free work. Um, and um, don't be afraid to say no because you should turn down work that's wrong for you. Absolutely. And the way that I have learned how to feel confident in saying no is that I have to have two yeses before I say one yes. And so I only accept a project, whatever kind of project it is, if I have two yeses, and it has to be that, does the project grow me as a person? Yes or no? And can I genuinely contribute to that project? Yes or no? I have to have both yeses. It will grow me as a person, and I can genuinely contribute before I accept the project. If I have either no, I turn it down, because it's not right for me. Someone else should do it. Um, yes. I think that's great. I also think it's worth pointing out that um, just like you don't ever really, hopefully, arrive at a place where you say, I am now a wine expert. I have crossed the threshold and I have arrived. I think voice is a lifelong, sure. career-long journey. And I can give a very particular anecdote from my own life very recently in that, you know, I, uh, I have been writing for wine professionally in various capacities for 15 years. And um, I generally am known for, I would say, a very research-driven, semi-academic style. And that is what I, that's one, what won me the Rotor Awards, that's what my book is about. Um, and, you know, the pay for articles is not great. And to research, to put in all that research is so time-consuming. And I have a, a toddler now. So I've been saying no to more things, but I still want to write. And so at some point, I was being asked to write things, and I thought, I can't say yes to anything that's research-driven anymore unless the number makes sense and the number didn't make sense. So I started to offer to write more anecdotal things. And I felt like my voice was still very apparent in the acad more academic work in that I'm very, I, like, I, I, I enjoy being casual. I like poking fun at things. I like, you know, being slightly irreverent. Um, and I always thought that that voice was there in those works, but it was really hidden. The second I started writing, purely anecdotally, you know, kind of from my own life experience, solely focused on my own point of view with like a little bit of wine information, the opportunities to do more of that was just like, it was almost overwhelming. And it was, and I'm still distrustful of myself writing in that voice because it's very conversational, but that's what it's like to have a conversation with me. And so I'm aware that it's authentic, but it still feels scary. Um, and I still have a hard time believing that that's what people want, but then the response has been so positive. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, you try things on, you have a suit, that suit gets a little tight, you need to buy a bigger suit. Um, you find you find what is comfortable, and you know you grow. And then and go stretch. get uncomfortable. Yeah, and then you know? go yeah. go back yeah. to being uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. And and you change. You just as you, just as I wasn't. You know, I'm I'm not the same person I was, um, obviously 25 years ago um, when I joined the the wine industry. Um, you 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 should you should there should be an evolution. I think what's so extraordinary though about someone like Hugh Johnson is that you read his writing from, um, uh, you know sort of a, a, a earlier writing and you read his writing today and it was it's equally obviously it's, it's equally brilliant and equally beautiful so I, I it's a it's it's a conundrum I think um, uh, I think I think writers um, should always have a sense of progress and journey and discovery and change and and should always be trying different formats not only because they have to in this in today in today's world, but but because that's the only way they will get better at what they do. I think you know? it's very simple. Writers have to be writing to be writers. Yes. 
So if we have this idea in our head that we're writers, but we're not writing, right. then that's a then false idea. Yes. It doesn't mean we couldn't be a writer, but the point is we have to start doing it. Exactly. And, then, and we have to do it. Yes. Yeah. Um, this was wonderful. One last question before we wrap up, um, which is um, a very personal question from the audience. This says, what was the turning point in each of your careers when you knew you'd be successful as a communicator? Who wants to go first? <laughs> well, when we addressed this over in our prep call, and this question was read to me, I said, I don't think any of us can claim that. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, if you want, do you want me to break the ice? I sure, start? yes, please, yeah. Okay. I can tell you, whoever wrote the question, uh, the opposite answer, which was the moment I knew I had failed as a communicator. So I mentioned I don't come from a wine drinking family. I'm very proud of that. It's been one of the most useful things to me in keeping me grounded in the wine industry. Um, but I share wine with them. I speak about wine. I'm a professional wine communicator, for crying out loud. And um, I was on the phone with one of my family members once. My husband makes wine. He was getting ready to bottle. It's an extremely stressful thing to do if you've never done it. All sorts of things can go wrong. And I was just sort of Blying at them about how I was nervous and I was worked up, and they said, "Well, why? What? What? what what's going on? I mean, have you already added all of the things?" And I said, "What, like the sulfur?" And they said, "No, like the the lemon and the leather, and the and the green apple." And I thought, "I really suck at communicating about wine. This is very bad. This is very bad. It's not bad that they don't know that. I think most people like that's that was such a." precious window yes. into mis public misconceptions, yes. popular misconceptions. So it was so valuable. It was such a good mirror to me to say like, okay, I am fast forwarding through some very key steps or I am actually not listening to the people in my life. Um, when I'm sharing this, it's a one way road. It needs to be kind of backwards. It needs to run both ways rather. So um, that was a really important moment for me. Um, and I think that that, that, I, I, that is one of those sort of marks on the highway where I can say, that made me better. Um, do I, but like I said, I'm still learning. I'm still growing and changing. Uh, but that was, that was an important one. What about you, Claire? Mm -hmm. You go next. Um, so, yes, maybe, maybe in a similar vein, um, I, never, I never expected someone to read what I'd written. And, um, and actually, I still don't. So, so when someone does, um, it's, I, it's, um, I'm almost feeling sort of anxious <laughs> just talking about it. It's, it's, there's an anxious, it's, there's an anxiety. Um, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it means that I've been true to, to what I wanted to convey and that, and that that has been conveyed and, and therefore there's a part of me that has been sort of revealed through that. Um, I, um, I, would love, I would love to be considered a writer. That's the truth. The, the reality is that um, we, we write, we're as good as the last thing that, was, that someone else wrote, uh, that someone else read. Um, it's a compulsion. You write again. You move on. You write something else. And, and if it sticks, then, or, or if it affects someone, or if, or if someone has read it and has enjoyed it, or has commented on it, or hasn't liked it, and has also commented that it's that it's not any good, then then that's that's part of the part of the process. Um, but no, mo there was no epiphany, <laughs> um, not at all. It's uh, 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 th there will never be. I don't think. There, I'm not sure. I would ever be completely satisfied with something that I've written, but I recognize great writing. And there is an epiphany when you read extraordinarily good writing. And, and that's the holy grail, is, is, is being able to say, all right, so that's, that's extraordinary. So what have they done there? How, how, how do I take that and, and mold that into something that maybe I could pursue? I think for me, um, to work towards having success 
depends on us being honest with ourselves about what skills we do have, what talents we do have, what experiences we have had that can support our future work. Um, and we need to know these things because that helps us pursue our projects well and to know which projects are maybe a little past our grasp and so then have, we have to work harder for. Um, but, and so I think I'm at a point in my writing and my communication in general, so speaking and other forms of, of um, connecting with people, where I do know, I know the skills I have at least now and I, I am talented at certain kinds of things because I've built those talents by practicing them and trying to learn how to do them and studying these different skills. Um, and so in terms of success, I'll ask myself, well, what is this project about? You know, so last night, <laughs> Kelly very kindly let me read to her, her a 750 word article that I turned in last night right before I turned it in. And I knew very, you know, I, there's a very clear scope that must be reached for a specific length of article. And, um, and I have in my head what I want to deliver at this length. And I want it to be concentrated and impactful, but poetic and, and interesting and a discovery for the reader all at the same time. And so, because I knew... All in 150 words. 750. <laughs> oh, okay. 750, <laughs> which is still very quick. Um, and I think sometimes people make the mistake of thinking they only need to write 750 words. But actually, they need to write a lot right. and keep, keep pulling chopping. it back, keep pulling it back until they get to the 750. And so I, I'm going to admit something, which, is, which I almost never say. But I finished that piece, and I texted um, Kelly, and I said, oh my god, can I read you this piece before I turn it in? I think it might be good. And I, I almost, like, in my whole writing career, that's one of maybe two times I've ever thought that. Um, but whether it will connect isn't up to me, right? I don't get to decide if that side of the equation is successful or not. I get to practice my skills, figure out how to deliver them, fulfill the goals of the project. I can, I can work on that side of the success. Yes. I don't have anything to do with what happens Except next. Except I yeah. might be able to develop skills of figure, finding new platforms or things like that. But I can't determine how people respond to it. No. That's up to other people. Yes. Well, I, we haven't defined success in the context of this question, right? And I think that we talked a lot about voice, which comes down to authenticity, and the fact that you could write something and almost be scared because you think it's so good. Like That, to me, is the definition of successful wine communication. It means you're so in, in alignment with your own voice and intention that it's like scary and you feel it. And it was mm -hmm. a nice, it was, it was a really wonderful text to receive. I felt very touched that you would reach out to me. It was so much nicer than the time I emailed you the chapter <laughs> for On Burgundy and said, could you read this? I think it might be really bad. <laughs> well, and, I, and so I immediately was like, send it right now, I'm reading it. And then as soon as I finished, I called and I was like, this is really good, you need to do more of this. Yeah, it was the anecdotal style. Yeah, that was but, the beginning yeah. of the anecdotal. Anyway, um, we have hit time. And uh, it was such an honor to be on stage with both of you, who I admire so much. And uh, thank you so much to you. Oh, thank you. We actually have 10 more minutes. Oh, oh. oh. So <laughs> I am going to take the host's prerogative and see if I can stump you with one okay. last question. Oh, go on. If that's OK with you. Yeah. No wine cuisine. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. No, it won't be that. OK. Be that. One of the questions that motivated this panel is how much the world has changed since Hugh started writing 50 odd years ago. And the kinds of issues that he kind of cut his teeth on, um, what are those issues for you? So I want to ask each of you, you know, from your point of view, what is the one issue that you need to be writing about related to wine to communicate with, you know, the world something about it that is very important and maybe wasn't, you know, thought about 50 years ago, but is really important today. I'll, so I'll, I'll go first if you don't mind. So when I started, when I very first started, um, I was lucky enough that one of the very first things I ever did in wine was actually attend a vineyard, health, uh, vineyard worker health care day. Um, and it was the whole range, uh, occupational health care, making sure that eye care was was good, private clinic checkups, um, uh, family, family care for the vineyard workers. 
I spent a whole day uh, learning about this program and um, actually was lucky enough to spend some one-on-one -on -one time interviewing some of the vineyard workers who were going. And, and I, I couldn't even believe it, but they really opened up. Um, this one man in particular opened up and told me his personal story. And um, he and I were crying together. It was like really, really a lot of trust. I was very lucky. And this is how I started. And so it was very clear to me the most important thing I could do was continuously try to understand the farming side and to, and to write about vineyard workers and to try to help people understand how can we support health care and, and education and general needs for vineyard workers. And it honestly took until the 2017 fires when so much housing was lost for me to convince a magazine we should be writing on this kind of issue. It took, it, it took from um, 2012 until 2017 and I was talking about this constantly. It took that long. And thankfully, and then in 2020, I was able to do a webinar on um, how to be an ally for vineyard workers. And I really, at the time, believed it was one of the most important things I'd ever accomplished and, and um, still believe that. And so thankfully now, every, what's being written about has really changed and more people now write about that and realize the farming side, the people side is so essential. And um, so I continue to try to improve on my ability to communicate that. But the other piece that's become so incredibly clear in the last few years is I've done, it, er, done everything I can to really try to make sure I understand um, what genuine sustainability is about and, um, and how that can tie to climate action. And I'm con continuously um, interviewing researchers so that I can improve my ability to communicate about these issues to people that don't have the time to be interviewing researchers. And so that's, that's where I'm really compelled. Hmm. Yes, beautifully said. Beautifully said. I think that is exceptionally important. I think I would go, um, and this is, uh, I wouldn't be the one writing this, but, um, but maybe, maybe you two will um, and do. Um, so it takes on a little bit more from carrying on from your theme or the sustainability, climate change and so forth. Clearly um, is something that um, we as an industry are facing every day and have been for a, a long time. And, and I think... I think when Hugh started writing, you know, he was dis he was allowing the he was he was bringing the world, discovering the world regions of wines and bringing those to um, to, to to those minds and readers who um, who bit by bit explored the world with him with the extraordinary maps that 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 he put together and 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 so forth. But um, it was a he, he was he was discovering, but also. Um, educating gently and, and, and wisely and elegantly um, the appellation systems and the, uh, the, the concept of special places producing very special um, expressions of, of, of wine. And I think that what we are now facing, um, ironically, is that everything we thought we knew and had, that had mastered about these special places, especially these places that have been in production for so long, that is changing. Those expressions are changing because of what's happening to the climate, because of temperature change, because of pests and, and, and diseases, because of fire, because of drought. So, so as a wine, as a wine, we can, as a wine writer and as wine writers, um, uh, we, we cannot sit back and say, this is what this wine tastes like from this region, or this is what this region has been doing for centuries and they're doing it so well, or this is how we should be parceling up our creating appellations. I mean, California is a perfect example. Paso, perfect example of a region that is, that is obsessed at the moment with cutting up, making smaller parcels, calling them different aviation, uh, creating an appellation system. And there's a part of me that says, you know, I respect that. I'm European, <laughs> I respect that fundamentally, but you need to understand that this is an ever-shifting, ever-changing, ever-evolving, and actually faster than ever. And, and that is some, that's a story worth, I think, worth exploring and discovering and writing about. Um, but I won't have the words. I think you two will do oh, it better than I will. <laughs> You're going to write it. You're going to write it. And you can text us when you're ready, and we'll tell yeah. you to hit send. <laughs> I, I think for myself, you know, increasingly, 
what I want is to make people from all backgrounds feel comfortable about wine. Um, I know that it was a huge foreign, untouchable thing when I was getting started. It was not a part of the way I was raised. And I think, you know, I felt in order to play in that sandbox, you know, I practically bankrupted myself trying to kind of, you know, keep up with, with everybody. And I, and I see how the wine industry intentionally or accidentally or just through history um, has created so much anxiety in people um, instead of joy. Yes. And that's very, very sad to me. I, my writing for me now is m much more of a side hustle. Um, I've been teaching classes for the last three and a half years as a vocation. And it's incredible to me that almost every class begins with an apology. That The person sitting in front of me says, I'm so sorry. I really don't know that much about wine. I like it. I like to know more, but I don't, I don't know all the things. And you don't, it's not, it's like going into a doctor's office and being like, I'm so sorry. I know I need to know more about kidney stones, but like, I don't. So you might as well. That they're there to learn. It shouldn't feel, you shouldn't have to start with feeling inad this feeling of inadequacy or like you don't deserve it or um, it doesn't, it, it, it's such a serious thing, you know. And so kind of breaking away from some of the pretensions and, and or celebrating the traditions worth celebrating and pointing out the things that, you know, are unnecessary foolish baggage of wine affectation and, and language, um, just making it more comfortable for people and, you know, sort of giving them permission to let go of all the stress of having to figure out if it's raspberry or cranberry right. and just, you right. know, coming at it from a really, also a sincere and authentic place because it is such a m mystical, vague, beautiful beverage. You know, it's, mm. it's, it's not a, you know, fabric we're buying by the yard. It's, it's, yes. it's, it's, it's something very amorphous and because of that you could make it incredibly personal. You have to. Yes. Um, and so that's, that's increasingly important to me. Please join me in thanking our terrific panelists for this wonderful discussion. <laughs> what a great way to end. Um, before we close, I'd also like to thank the library staff who made this event a success, as well as the university's academic technology team for managing AV uh, with a very large online audience. Hi, all you. Uh, finally, there are a couple of things you won't want to miss during the reception as you enjoy your wine. I encourage you to check out the exhibition of items from Hugh Johnson's archive, uh, which the Archives and Special Collections Department has laid out in the lobby. And uh, also in the lobby, you will find copies of On California available for purchase to add to your own personal wine library. So with that, thank you again for coming, and please enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you.